This week on Intrigued, Full Effect. We need to set a protocol that happens, you know, when someone goes missing. Protocol is very important to, like, Native tribes or organizations and things like that. We all have a certain protocol that we go by. That needs to happen, you know, with these cases. We may not find the killer, we may not find where our loved one went, but when we interview these families and they focus much more on the story and celebrating life and how the person really was when they were here. I'm Chandrea Thomas and welcome to episode four, part two. In this podcast, I talk about curious cases, disappearances, and other stuff. And today, I'm continuing the conversation about the 2017 disappearance of 20-year-old Ashley Loring Heavy Runner on the Blackfeet Reservation in Browning, Montana. I spoke to her family in part one. In this episode, I'm talking to activist Deborah Maytoby, who runs a nonprofit focused on raising awareness for missing and murdered Indigenous women. I also spoke to Ivan McDonald, a documentary filmmaker who's raising awareness about the silent crisis through his work. The conversations were deep, so let's get into my chat with Deborah. This is what happened. I'm talking with Deborah Maytubey. She is the person who started the Organization of Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women USA. Deborah, thank you for joining me. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So first off, just tell me about the organization and how you got started with all of it. My husband is Navajo, and so we we live, moved down to the Navajo Reservation. We were very involved in Gallup, the border town, and I actually had two friends that were murdered there. Deborah's friends were murdered in 2012 and 2015. At that time, she thought the violence was concentrated in the Southwest. It's Sharon Gorman or, and Andrea Begay, and after that... You know, I mean, it really, I I started researching, you know, what was going on. I started hearing the the family's stories and it broke my heart because they had felt so abandoned. Around 2015, Deborah moved to Portland and noticed the stories of missing and murdered victims were being echoed from reservations all across the country. That's when she started the nonprofit called Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women USA. The goal is to help families who need support. The worst reservation in the United States is like a two-hour drive from us. That really got me going and We started the page in 2015, you know, to create awareness. After the first year, we realized that there were literally thousands of these families out there. I always tell everyone, tell all the families, people care, they just didn't know. And that's what we're seeing. People do really care. But that's how we started, was out of the um, deaths of my two friends. Deborah also says that more people should be aware of the silent crisis. It was just literally thousands of people out there with no idea of what was going on in their child's case, no investigation, no searches. From what I've been learning from people who I've been talking to about this particular issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women and men, that's the other part of it too, is that... Yeah, absolutely. Is that they feel as though whatever legal system you guys have in place on the reservation seems to not be working for them. That's what I'm gathering from these conversations. Yes. And it's not just a couple. It's like every family has the same story. When my first friend got murdered, when Sharon got murdered, others around us weren't even reacting. And I was like, what is going on with you guys? You know, Sharon's gone. And We need to try to find justice and all that. And like, there was just no expression of anything. And that's when I realized that they were used to this. They shut off emotionally from it because it happens all the time. When you say it's the norm, it's become the norm. Do you have any type of uh, statistical information that goes along with that or any numbers that go along with what's happening on the reservations across the country? Well, this is the thing. It's like, as far as statistics go, the federal government keeps no statistics on us at all, on crimes against us or crimes committed in Indian country. And so, you know, what we're having to do right now is 
actually create our own databases. And my son's got a program that he's getting ready to launch that will allow uh, people across the country to log in and add the missing and the murder. So when it comes to the cases like Ashley Loring, you know, that's that's one of the cases that I'm looking at right now. What do you think of when you hear Ashley's case? It, it almost sounds as if through conversations that I've had is Ashley's case is one of many that, that it's it's something that's commonplace. Like you said, it's the norm. And I'm like, that's not the norm. It shouldn't be the norm yeah. for anyone. Yes. And I agree. And regarding Ashley Loring, and excuse me if I get a little choked up on Ashley, because her sister Kimberly and Lissa live here in Portland. And so we actually know each other, you know, face to face. They have came to uh, came to meetings that we've had, you know, regarding a new program that we're starting and and. And, and then sit with us at powwows and things like that. And to see what they've been through is, is one of the saddest things I've been faced with because in their case, uh, Kimberly has searched over a hundred times on her own, oftentimes going up, and not even having enough food to eat, only having like enough money for gas, you know, to get get up on the mountain. Ashley's name is really out there. That's all because of them. They're fighting, you know, they're fighting hard. Is there a common denominator, you think, between all of that? Is, is it something that's kind of people have become culturally numb to what's happening? What do you think the major issue is? Well, I think the major issue, like, within uh, our own behavior is, you know, it's like I'm a sociologist, and we have known in the last two years that uh, historical trauma runs in a bloodline. It's passed down through DNA. Historical trauma has a lot to do with the way that we're behaving During my conversation, I found out some interesting facts about the reservation that I never knew. On these reservations, those are not reservations that are owned, you know, by the tribe or anything like that. They don't belong to them. And the feds are in charge of all the law enforcement. Anything above a misdemeanor is is given straight to the feds. If people know that they can get away with murder they're going to do it, you know, and especially when they've set the stage by not only are a missing and murder not being acknowledged, they're letting drugs run onto our reservations. We are seeing a link to methamphetamine in about two thirds of these cases. What do you think is a solution to the issues that are plaguing the reservation? Well, I think we need to set a protocol that happens, um, you know, when someone goes missing. Um, protocol is very important to, like, Native tribes or organizations and things like that. We all have a certain protocol that we go by. Well, that needs to happen, you know, with with these cases, too. Like, if this, this, and this happen, well, this needs to be done. Deborah also talked about Savannah's Act. The 2017 bill basically says the Department of Justice has to keep track of missing and murdered Native Americans and improve justice protocols on the reservation. At this point, the bill is stalled, but there are plans to reintroduce it later on this year. It's named after 22-year-old Savannah Graywind, a member of the Spirit Lake Nation who was eight months pregnant when she was murdered in August of 2017. The killer who brutally cut the baby from Savannah's body is serving life in prison without parole. The baby girl named Hazley Jo survived, and now she's living with her father. That act specifies that all law enforcement work must work in conjunction with each other. You can't go pointing your finger at the other. You know, it sets a protocol, too. And it also orders every state and every national law enforcement agency to keep track of Native people. 
even within tribes, there's there's not a lot of documentation. We have to like take oral stories, you know, oral stories as as a evidence of things because it's just not recorded. But like Savannah's act will will help a lot. When it comes to your organization, so it's Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women USA, right? right. That's the, the exact name of it. What exactly do you do? Well, like I was saying, like at first we were informational, you know, we tried to help the women. There's things that happen, you know, like people don't have tombstones, you know, people don't have burial money. So we'd help raise money for that. I think we bought like four or five tombstones in the few years that we've been um, doing this and We've helped pay uh, electric bills because, you know, somebody, you know, when you go to bury somebody, especially of a violent crime, you want to make sure that they're well taken care of in their rest. So you spend money you don't ordinarily have to do this. And so other bills go unpaid. So we Mm -hmm. help with stuff like that. And then when we were able to start getting grants, Then we started really helping, like, every family we'd see, you know, we'd we'd shoot them some help. Every day, in some way, we're fighting for for a family, you know, and um, fighting for our women. A lot of people call in and gives us, you know, tips and things like that. We're well-trusted now, and... And we really have earned that. When it comes to a message that you have for families who are dealing with a missing and murdered loved one, what would be your message for them? My message would be to hold on. Just, you know, the main point being you're not alone. We'll help you do anything that needs to be done. If we don't know the answers, we find them. And we'll make sure you're taken care of in a proper way, in a respectful way. A 2016 study about violence on Native women by the National Institute of Justice says at least 84% have experienced some violence in their lifetime. It also says that 56% are victims of sexual violence. Any hopes for the future? Well, we've got a program um, that we just started this summer. It's called Staying Sacred. And it's a preventative program um, for young women and girls from 10 to 18 our hope and our main main purpose in staying sacred is to be the light that we didn't have when we were sexually assaulted or were, you know, um, going through all these things and um, empower, you know, empowering people is uh, that's one of the most sacred gifts that you can give someone is, um, to let them know they do have power, that they are hurt. Our hope is, you know, by the time these little girls have children, we want this to be just a very, very bad memory in um, our, our history. And that leads me to my second activist, Ivan McDonald. He's raising awareness for his people through his work as a filmmaker. His latest project is called When They Were Here. I had a chat with him about why he's speaking out. When it comes to the whole issue of uh, missing Native American women, what's been going on with that? Because it seems like it suddenly became a thing, but I don't know how long this has actually actually been going on. Yeah, so I think if you really want to look at the um, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls crisis, you kind of have to understand it um, from the onset of colonization. Um, Sarah Deer, who's a Muscogee Creek legal scholar at the University of Kansas, sort of kind of wrote one of the first big, big foundational texts on violence against Indigenous women. And she was able to find firsthand accounts um, about Spanish colonizers who came with Columbus, who committed acts of sexual, um, physical, mental, spiritual, cultural abuse, against the uh, women and women that indigenous women that were in the Caribbean. And it's kind of just carried on since then. Um, Manifest Destiny, 
when the West was sort of getting more colonized and settled per se, um, there were still high, high rates of violence. Um, and bringing it into the modern day, the rates of violence are still very present in some of the highest around. So the the long-term results of what's happened in the past is what's haunting you now when it comes to the number of people who are missing and the amount of crimes and things that are committed on the reservation? Yeah, I mean, you know, sort of, I always tell people that um, there's many different facets of historical trauma, which a lot of um, Indigenous people sort of believe has happened to us collectively. And um, violence, specific gender-based violence, is sort of one of those big issues. I mean, um, a lot of the more first-hand accounts or texts I've been able to find, similar to Sarah Deer, have stated uprisings on reservations or forts started because of the violence that Indigenous women were facing or in tribal communities. Tribe Indigenous and Native women had some of the highest rates of um, sex trafficking in the 1800s during the California Gold Rush. Since the colonization of the Americas in 19, or 1492, I don't think you can isolate any specific time um, and present a time that there wasn't some sort of violence happening against Indigenous women. And there's sort of these reverberations, which are currently, we're still experiencing. So basically what you're saying is when it comes down to it, historically, since the 1400s, 1492, that era leading all the way up to today, there's been this history of the abuse of Native women, or you say say Indigenous women, um, yeah. that has pretty much carried on into the 21st century. So now you're seeing cases of these disappearances. They seem to be more in the media now. So I don't know what yeah. it is that's that's creating that buzz around that. Can you explain that to me? I think that's been kind of a big push um, due to activists. Um, one of the big things that I think most people are surprised of when they learn about sort of the grassroots efforts of um, combating violence against native native and indigenous women is kind of, you know, wow, it's so expansive. I mean, you could sort of turn to any tribal community and see that there's um, some sort of response. And I think that a lot of the times with the newer cases, um, I have to say social media has been a huge, huge factor in getting those cases more out in the open. Um, there used to be times when, um, you know, women would go missing in Montana. I would, we, with with a few other people, we would kind of figure out what reservation they were from and then really, really push hard on the news media, local news stations that were in that area to cover, cover the issue. Um, that was something I think it's really boiled down to that I don't think the cases are happening more. It's just that they're becoming more out in the open. When something on the reservation happens, like... Um, corruption or embezzlement charges, you can guarantee that it will be in the local media within um, that same day. But when a teen, um, a, a teen girl from the same area goes missing, a, teen, a native teen girl, um, you know, it's sometimes days before it's reported on. Wow, that seems to be the same issue that happens with people of color, all people of color, oh, exactly. <laughs> you know, when you stop and think about trying to get that coverage for sure. So, I mean, that's pretty much my push for why I'm doing this podcast, because I yes. think it's important for these stories to be out there, because honestly, I didn't realize this stuff was happening. I have friends who live on a reservation in Arizona. Through all the years of knowing them, this type of conversation never took place. So yeah. I was really surprised to know that, you know, and I'm and, and actually... I'm starting to wonder, too, is it kind of concentrated to certain areas of the United States or is it pretty much when you speak generically about reservations that are all across, you know, the U.S.? Mm -hmm. Um, I think you kind of I haven't actually seen like a statistical breakdown regarding to that. I can sort of speak anecdotally. Um, And so specifically, you know, Montana has one of the highest rates of um, Indigenous women who have gone missing or have been murdered. And I think that's due to the disproportionate amount of um, Native people within the state. So Montana, um, the second largest group outside of white people, um, is Native people. And so I think that when um, there's currently six um, federally recognized tribes and one state recognized tribe, and so, you know, give or take any area in the state, you're probably within an hour, at least an hour or two, to a reservation. Um, Arizona, Utah, um, Washington, specifically, a lot of these places Mm -hmm. with larger Native populations, I think the percentages are higher, but I think looking at any 
state, any area with um, indigenous people, even like a small community, they're they're most likely still disproportionately affected. Mm-hmm. Do, do, do you have any statistical information that you've been able to discover as you've worked on your uh, documentary? Um, yeah, you know, I, I sort of um, I actually started working on the documentary when I was in grad school, getting my master's at the University of Montana. And so I had more access to um, these the, those amazing databases where you can kind of look for that specific information. Um, I used to spend hours looking through governmental reports, um, organizational reports, sort of anything I could kind of get my hands on. That's sort of another Another issue that comes up when sort of quantifying the crisis is there really isn't much, much data. Um, A lot of the accounts we hear are sort of anecdotal, but we have to back them up through um, oral testimony, looking at police reports. Um, Speaking in general, there is no federal mandate to list the ethnicity of someone um, when they're found to be murdered. Um, there is no federal mandate to list anything um, related to ethnicity when someone is kidnapped. And so trying to find statistics, um, really hard, cold, um, like these are the statistics, this is what's happening, is sometimes hard. But um, currently within 2018, um, the last numbers I saw, over 600, there was over 600 active cases of missing Indigenous women within the state or within the United States. Um, that was from the National Crime Information Center, but they have over 5,000 cases, but there was only 600 that were active, over 600 that were active. Um, some scholars think that that number could be three to four to possibly even five times higher. But because data isn't accurately tracked, um, it's sort of hard to quantify. Within Montana specifically, um, Indigenous women and girls are probably around 3 to 3.3, 3.5% of the population, but um, hover anywhere between 30 to 40% of those deemed missing by the Montana Department of Justice. Wow. Okay, so let me get this straight. So while the percentage is 3% within Montana, but the number of missing persons cases when it comes to that state is 40% indigenous women, just so I'm clear. Yeah, yeah, so it usually hovers around 30 to 40. Um, I get those numbers from the Montana Missing Persons Clearinghouse, which is through the Montana Department of Justice. So I tend to go in every, um, every two weeks, every month, and sort of calculate my ratios and figures. And I think the last time I did that was at the beginning of December. And um, the number was, I think, around 33% of those deemed missing. Um, those are ones that have just been had police reports filed. They've been entered on, entered into Department of Justice databases um, of Indigenous women. So, you know, still very much disproportionate, disproportionate in the state. Wow. So what do you think is happening? Do you think these um, young women are being trafficked? Do you think people are, are murdering them or they're just running away? What you know, what have you guys come up with? I don't think you can pinpoint it to any specific because it kind of runs the whole gamut. We've heard stories of um, women who have been trafficked. Um, I think there's this interesting fact sort of, you know, and again, this is just anecdotally and from my own research I've done, there's a bit of this um, women and girls who go missing not on their own accord, who are kidnapped, um, murdered, um, but there is also this um, possible other subset group of women who go missing on their own. So they leave the harsh environments of reservation, the historical trauma, sort of those oppressive systems that are in place. Um, They can sometimes leave that on their own accord, but a lot of the times when they do leave on their own accord, the situations aren't very safe. So currently, in, on my own reservation, on the Blackfeet Reservation, um, there's a girl who just went missing probably within the last three, two to three weeks, and um, she um, was kidnapped. Kidnapped, and so um, oh, there's some wow. talk. Yeah, there's some talk of whether she was um, whether she willingly went with this person and was kidnapped or she was just kidnapped in general. And I think that's a lot of the things you can kind of um, break it down and put it into one group, but you know, it's still the fact that a lot of these times these women are going missing um, 
due to factors that are a lot of the time out of their own control. So you and your sister decided to do this documentary to hope to put this whole thing together. What what is it that you're actually focusing on? What is the premise behind what you're doing? And how long have you been working on it? When when will you be finished? I'm asking all these questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we actually began the project last year. Um, I was kind of looking for, it's actually while I was still in grad school, we had to do a project on, um, for one of my classes, what, what can you, what kind of social impact project can you do? How can you affect a large percentage of um, your community, educate them on a topic? Um, and so, you know, I come from a, I, I come from a um, sort of more academic research background. So I was like, well, you know, I'll write an article, I'll get that published, da, 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 da. But um, I, when I decided to focus on missing and murdered Indigenous women, I was like, if I'm going to get this information out and disseminated, the people who need to see it aren't going to get the information from some academic journal. They have to pay $30 to access. Um, and it's mm-hmm. also a very personal issue. Um, in 1979, our cousin Monica was kidnapped and murdered on the Blackfeet Reservation. She was kidnapped from um, her elementary school and later found frozen to a mountain on the outskirts of the reservation. Um, Ashley Loring Heavy Runner. Wow. Yeah, Ashley Loring Heavy Runner, who's currently missing. Um, you spoke with her sister Kimberly. That's another mm-hmm. one of our relatives. Um, when we were first sort of starting this project, I spoke with some family members, and just off the top of their heads, um, they could come up with at least four to five family members who would fall under the umbrella of missing and murdered Indigenous women. Um, Wow. And and that's that's since like the 1970s, you said when you're um, from the, the young the young girl that you said that was found. Yeah. In the yeah. 1970s. She, yeah, she went missing. Uh, she went missing in 1979 um, and was actually found a few days later. Did they ever find out what happened to her or who did that um, to her? No, no. Um, I remember we actually interviewed our uncle for. Um, I mean, we we so when we began research, we interviewed our uncle to sort of give us a foundation of you know how does this happen? How do families deal with this? Um, and when she first went missing, um, you know, it was kind of oh you know she she wandered off with friends. She'll be back. She sort of you know she's just hiding out for a time. And you know this was a this was a seven year old, um, mm-hmm. and this was in the middle of winter on the Blackfeet Reservation, which is a very very harsh environment at that time. And um, so my parent or so my aunt and uncle weren't really able to file a report to a few days later. Um, and when they did finally find the body, it was actually one of her uncles who found her. They had to form their own search party. The FBI came in and investigated for two weeks left. My uncle says he never heard from them again, but off and on, my aunt reportedly heard from them. They would call her every few years. Oh, we have some new lead, um, possible DNA. We're going to exhume her body and test. And, you know, she would never hear from them again until um, eight, nine, ten years later. Um, And so that's really kind of trying to understand our own history and experience with it um, Mm -hmm. has sort of become like a big, big part of the project. And my sister, she even speaks of, she even speaks of that, um, the fact that she's a woman and statistically speaking, she's more prone to have some sort of act of violence against, act of violence committed against her. And she sort of always, um, whenever we do talks or interviews or presentations, she talks about her own um, trying to grapple with that and really understand of like, well, why is, why is this a reality for me? What is this way to the world for me? It sounds like, from what I'm gathering, there's a lot of pain, too, in, in having conversations with Ashley's family. They spoke with a lot of emotion, and, and it sounds like it's just a painful thing that consistently happens, and it's like people, from what I gather, feel like they're alone in some capacity, or that they don't have any recourse, or that they, they need help, and they need to know where the help is. Do you get a sense of that? Have you Have you encountered that? Yeah, I mean, anytime we've um, spoken with, interviewed a family, a lot of the times families don't get that justice they seek. Um, we did a presentation a few few months ago, and um, we sort of talked about that, you know, justice for Indigenous people doesn't always 
look the same. So we may not find the killer. We may not find where our loved one went. But when we interview these families and they focus much more on the story and celebrating life and how the person really was when they were here, which kind of um, grew into the foundation for our pro- for the documentary, which is called When They Were Here, we sort of bring up the fact that we know this crisis is real. We don't have to make it real for anyone. Um, our work kind of focuses on, well, how do we celebrate the life and the resiliency and the um, survival aspect of these families who go through a terrible, terrible loss like this? So we focus on um, oral history, remembrance, those more indigenous forms of um remembering. Mm-hmm. So the, the title of your documentary is When They Were Here. That's the title yes. of it. Um, when when will you guys be finished with it? How much work have you done on it so far? Yeah, yeah. So currently the stage we're um, sort of deemed in is pre-production. We've sort of left our research phase. Um, we have begun to look for some funding. We found some funding to sort of help us move us into the next production production stage, which is the big one when we do, we do most of our filming. But um, we're hoping to get enough funding to hope to hopefully start shooting late spring, early summer. That's sort of when um, the weather specifically were, will be a bit more agreeable. Um, we're going to be filming on the Blackfeet Reservation where Ivy and I are from, and that tends to be a very harsh environment in the winter. And um, so we're going to be filming sometime, hopefully, um, late spring, late summer. And when do you think you'll be done with it? Do you have a target date? Yeah, yeah. so, you know, probably film um, well over the summer, wrap up sometime um, early spring and start that pre-production stage mid of middle of fall, late winter, and hopefully have some sort of um, bare bones for the film um, this mm-hmm. time hopefully next year. Is there any type of message or anything that you think you would like to convey? Especially, let me ask you this. Let me roll this back a little bit. What do you think are the biggest misconceptions about Indigenous people, Indigenous women in general? What would you say that would be? Um, I think what I've been finding specifically researching this topic um, so often from specifically, you know, non-Indigenous people, we're sort of told, well, you know, you guys are doing that to yourselves. Um why are you trying to make this big issue when you need to work on your own communities? And I um, always have to tell people that statistically, in re- reality speaking, um, Indigenous people are sort of the only ethnic group where a large proportion of the violence that's committed against us is from non-Native, non-Indigenous people. There was a landmark study from the National Justice Institute of, um, probably about five years ago or so that showed that um, 90% of the acts of violence that are committed against Indigenous women are from non-Native men. But I think that people don't understand with the sort of legal jurisdictional issues that are present on reservations that, um, you know, they're prone to violence because of those, because of that environment of, you know, tribes Mm -hmm. aren't able to prosecute non-tribal members and so when someone when a non-tribal member commits an act of violence on a reservation against a native woman there often isn't very much recourse for the tribe to even try to begin to look for justice and that, that sounds like that's part of why ashley's sister went to congress to speak yes and to to get some of that out there so did you capture any of that or what did you think about that yeah no i thought it was a really beautiful beautiful message from um Kimberly. Kimberly um, had to pester, had to contact, had to leave messages to get the FBI involved for well over um, nine months. By the time the FBI did get involved, um, Ashley had already been missing for almost a year. Um, And that kind of plays into a lot of these cases of when someone goes missing on a reservation, there's this fumbling around of well, who's going to investigate that? Did they go missing on the reservation? Did they go missing off? Um, but the person who possibly made them go missing, are they Native? Are they non-Native? So there's this push and pull and back and forth. And the people who are left to deal with all of that are the families whose loved ones do go missing or are murdered. And so I think Ashley provided that real heartfelt testimony. We've actually been on a... Um, a search on the reservation 
with um, Kimberly, and you know she's she's not going to stop until she finds some sort of justice for her and her family. And I think that's so often the case that that's what so many families are left with. You know, how do we find our own justice? Mm-hmm. And what what I also read recently was that there was a body found on the Blackfeet Reservation about mid December. Did anybody say anything about what's happening with that at this point? Yeah, no, the last thing I had heard was that the um, body was sent to the FBI headquarters for um, testing, um, some sort of DNA testing, but I haven't heard much. Um, yes, yeah, so then are saying how long the body's been there, No, nothing about the condition or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, no, I just heard that it was found at the more southern edge of the reservation. And so, you know, that's sort of all the information um, I've heard. Mm-hmm. Do you, is there anything else that, that I didn't ask you about that you think people need to know? Yeah, I just think, you know, um, there isn't a Native person, a Native community, a Native um, reservation that hasn't, doesn't have some sort of story of a loved one, um, a loved mother, daughter, sister, aunt, cousin, next door neighbor, um, who's been either murdered or missing. I think any time you could visit, pick a reservation at random, and you'd be able to pro- find someone who has some sort of story to share. And um, I think that's just something people don't often get when they sort of begin to look at the look at the crisis. What do you think would be the biggest lesson that will be learned from this documentary? I think it could just be, you know, this crisis has been, you know, 500 years in the making and um, it hasn't really slowed down since those first, uh, those first ships arrived off the coast of the Caribbean. And, um, you know, really trying to understand why the structure, the structure, the foundation um, for justice for Native people, why this structure has been built for us, but we had no hands in making it, and why so often we fall through the cracks of that structure. Mm -hmm. Very insightful, very insightful. All right, Ivan, thank you very much for taking the time to talk with me. I know you have a lot of work to do. And I will be keeping an eye out for your documentary, When They Were Here. I love that title, by the way. That is an excellent title. Yeah, celebrating the life of the person, how they were when they were here. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Thank you. When it comes to my final thoughts about this episode, I have to say that my eyes were opened. Just when I thought I had a good understanding of the reservation, I realized that I had a lot to learn. Now I have a better understanding about the historical and deep-rooted plight of people living on reservations all across the country. I learned that some feel invisible and helpless, and they're not getting the justice they deserve. They want to be heard. They also want people to know that they will no longer stand for injustice. And you know what? I'm so glad I did this episode, which is actually one of the longest I've ever done in my series so far. There was so much to learn so much to hear, so much to absorb, and it was time well spent. So what do we do now? I think it's important for us to pay more attention to what's happening outside of our own bubble and to get a better understanding of the world around us. If you're curious about a culture or a religion, all you have to do is ask a question. It's as simple as that. I want to thank the Loring family, Deborah Maytubi and Ivan McDonald for sharing their insight on this important story. Thank you. If you have any cases or disappearances that you want me to check out, just message me on the Intrigued Full Effect website or via email at intriguedfulleffect at hotmail.com. Until next time, be safe and stay true. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the Intrigued Full Effect, Curious Cases, Disappearances, and Other Stuff podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of the host. The primary purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. The host of this podcast assumes no liability or responsibility for any activities in connections with opinions shared in the podcast. The podcast and blog associated with it shall not be used in any legal capacity or as a basis for expert testimony. No guarantee is given regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on the podcast or blog. 
This podcast uses copyrighted materials that were fully authorized by the owner. Music by Pond5